right, good morning everybody watching the Governor's Balloon Safari's Facebook page. We are now live, coming to you from the Masai Mara. Now, I, of course, am not in the balloon right now, and so... Good morning, everybody. <laughs> I am narrating from the studio, and on camera today we have got Senzor all the way from South Africa. This is his first balloon ride over the Masai Mara and he's having a wonderful time, as you can see. Now, if you are perhaps watching this, well, it would be nice if you were watching it. At the moment, this is not one person watching this, but that's okay. Um, we're flying over the green ribbon. <laughs> one person watching now. The green ribbon that is the Mara River. It is a huge riverine forest that stretches probably about 200 metres or so either side of the Mara River. And of course that is the central feature of the migration that is currently about... currently about... Uh, well... Um, 20 kilometres to the south of where this balloon is now flying. There are 100 thousand or so villabiest massing on either side of the river. So with any luck, in a week or two they will be around the area that Senzo is currently filming. Five people watching now, astounding audience. So let's see what he can find. <clears throat> in these riverine areas you'd expect to see some of the primates that have spent their nights up in the trees, the olive baboons, perhaps a monkey or two. You might see a warthog flushed from a burrow. You might find a buffalo just making its way wearily out from under a bush. And perhaps an elephant herd or two that's beginning to feed on the rich, nutritious browse available in those river iron forests. Away to the south is where that's the direction that we're heading now. You can see a... Well, you can see the plains of the Mara and you can see the Olololo escarpment in the background. And it's these plains, of course, that nourish those massive herds of wildebeest and zebra and Thompson's gazelles. Now, if you are watching this show, which uh, 33 of you are, hello, all of you, hello, Janine, you've sent through a comment. You can send through any comments you'd like, any questions, we'll happily talk to you. You can ask us questions and we shall engage for the next 45 minutes or so as sins or dry or flies gently over one of the world's most romantic wilderness areas there. He spotted what looks like two starlings. Yep. I think those are two starlings. Very nice. Those are his first pieces of wildlife from the balloon. And what's fun about this, of course, is that it's completely and utterly without the ability to pause. So it's a little bit like time, if you like. There's no way for us to pause. We have to live completely in the moment of what we're doing here. The balloon is at the mercy of the wind. It can go up and down according to the whims of the pilot. But unfortunately, it is unable to stop. And so, much like our lives, uh, we have to just appreciate the moment as they pass fleetingly by, and then we move on. There are some impala, wonderful mammals, small groups of impala here in East Africa, and they'll be grazing, relieved to have made it through the night, unscathed by lions or leopards, largely would be their predators out here, I suppose hyenas as well, and I suspect that you would have found that they, well, probably would have spent much of the night out in the open there, waiting to see what was coming, I suspect, on that sort of uh, grassless patch there because of course the grass is very long here it's an excellent spot for the predators to hide and if you watch the predators moving even in the day you can see how perfectly adapted they are to this area and McLeod you say you're going to be here in August and hoping to see the wildebeest crossing the Mara well I hope that is exactly what you're going to see Anne uh, we certainly saw it last year Marcia you say hello um, Tammy, you say oh, the animals aren't spooked. Uh, they are a little bit. It depends on the height of the balloon. Because it reacts so slowly to the, how the pilot, well, you know, what the pilot wants it to do, you can come across, say, a warthog or a buffalo or a small herd of topi that will take fright. But it's not a, you know, they get used to it after a while and it's such a fleeting thing that we don't really worry about it too much. Hello, Aileen. Uh, 
Shrey Yanch Budia. Do, I hope I said that right. Do you get to see cheetahs on the balloon? Yes, Shrey Yanch, we do get to see cheetah every so often. We'd be very lucky. You know, they're not common, common of course, but we might be very lucky to see a cheetah or two. There isn't one there, of course. We're watching at the moment one of the game drives going out there on the road. And there, the Senzo is swinging around to the north. Now he's swinging back towards the south. There we go. Uh, there is a person with long hair next to him. <laughs> That's quite fun. So you can see the other guests, the tourists, taking their pictures. Just, I can tell you that they will be utterly astounded by what they're experiencing right now. It is, to use the dreadful cliché, bucket list stuff. There we have some rhinoceros. That is spectacular. Black rhinoceros. Mother and calf walking in the classic black rhinoceros formation of mum in front and baby behind. That is very special indeed. Look at that. Do start to run. Yes, it could be because the balloon is a little bit scary for them. Not so much when it's floating now, but of course if it starts to sink and threatens to sit on their backsides and the pilot is going to, of course, fire up the burners, which will make a noise which could frighten them. So I don't want you to worry about that. Like I say, it's a completely transient experience for them. Uh, the balloon will pass over the top of them very quickly. Isn't that wonderful? a question by him. Um, no, I've lost it. It's gone. Never mind that. Let's carry on watching these astounding creatures. Now, this, of course, is a highly endangered animal, the black rhino, uh, well protected here in the Mara Triangle, which is the area of the Mara that we're flying over now. And so they don't seem to be under any, well, of course, all animals are in danger in some way or another. But these ones very well protected and just very special. This is the first time I've seen a mother and calf out here. And I know there is a little bit of wobble every so often in, this, in the picture, but that's entirely normal. It is because, of course, this is totally handheld. You can see how excited those people are. You can also see that that man is not on a budget safari with that lens like that. Good for him. I'm sure he's going to have some wonderful pictures at the end of it. There's a hippo. That's fantastic. Making friends of the black rhino and now making its way slowly back towards the river where it will spend the rest of the day. Uh, Carl McKinney, you say, are there any females up here? Uh, I'm not sure what you referring to. There certainly there was a female rhinoceros. I don't know if there was a female uh, uh, hippo. There's a female just to the left of where Senzo is sitting now. Other than that, I'd say about 50% of the organisms in this area are female. Carl, thank you for that. Um, Frank, you say, how many of these rhinos are there in the park? I'm actually not sure. I need to check that up. I think they're probably around 200 or so, if I'm not mistaken. In fact, in the Mara Triangle, only about 55, I'm told. So, we can get... Sorry, I'm just trying to figure this out. Peter, say it loud. 1, 5, 15. 15 in the Mara Triangle. So, not that many in this particular area. In the ecosystem, you'll probably find that they're hopefully about 200 or so. There we go. We got that sorted out. Um, Marcia Rook said, do they ever drop rabies vaccine bait? And not that I know of, certainly not from the balloons with tourists on them. They don't tend to double as veterinary trips. Um, but that's an interesting thought, actually. I've never known about that. Jania Hill Rodriguez, you say a governor's balloon safari is the best. Well, I certainly think it's the best. Now, there are those rhino again. This is very special. Very, very special indeed. Kerry, you wanted to see a, a hippo, I think. Well, you got your wish. Now, this is interesting because, you know, where, I'm com where I come from, which is, of course, in South Africa, we don't see a lot of black rhino. We see quite a few white rhino. And there, the babies run in front of the mothers. And it's a classic rhino behavior that, well, there are various theories around and why that happens. But uh, we think that it is, of course, because the black rhino is a browser and therefore lives in the thicker bush. Uh, we're not looking at rhino right now, but um, there we go. The 
where they are. And because they live in the slightly thicker bush, normally uh, any ambush that is likely to come is likely to come from the front, and therefore the mother runs in front. But of course, out here, they live really quite a lot in the open, and the browse that they take here comes often in the form of small bushes in the clearings. Oh, that is just so very special, isn't it? is not leaving its mother's backside. <laughs> then what you did see off to the right-hand side there was some waterbuck and some topi, and they are as fascinated by the endangered species as we are. There they are. And then a big buffalo, I think, in the background there. Wonderful. He too is a rather disconcerted, I suppose, slightly by the balloon flying over him, wondering why or what the strange colourful bird is. There's some more impala, and there are the waterbuck and the topi that I was speaking of earlier. They too enjoying now the sunrise. As you can see, oh, that's just wonderful. And of course the sight of the black rhino. Just very special. Those are the Defesa waterbuck. Well, they were. And there's the buffalo. As I was saying, you just, it's a very transient experience. You fly over the top, and then it's gone. But, so we're just getting used to dealing with the exposure as the sun comes up. Makes it a little bit difficult for Senzo. There we go. He's got it now. And now we'll probably go over another bend in the river. So what's interesting here, of course, is that the clearings, or large open plains, I suppose clearing is, a, is an inappropriate word, the big open plains of the Mara are those that attract all the wildebeest, but this river cuts its way through the plains and it bends back on itself again and again and again, leaving this great swathe of green riverine vegetation that we're now flying over the top of. Now you may wonder why it is that we're suddenly facing the other direction. Well, the answer is, of course, because what the balloon pilot does, and I'm sorry about the picture right now, but we will fix it up. Um, what the balloon pilot does is he makes sure that everybody gets time in front and time behind, and he's able to swing the basket so he can swing on a sort of axis. He releases air from the top of the balloon, which acts like a jet, and it well, it acts a little bit like a sort of space suit, I guess, and it turns the balloon around through 180 degrees. It really is an enormous skill that they have. And of course, you can't do it too much, because then you'll lose all your air, and the balloon will plummet to the ground, which uh, hopefully this one won't. Lucille, do you want to know who the cameraman is? It is Senzo. This is his very first time in a balloon. Janine, you want to know, or yes, Janine, you want to know what the average flight time is. The average flight time, there's some wildebeest, not really part of a vast herd, uh, four of them, four or five. Um, it flies for about 45 minutes to an hour or so, Janine, and the distance really depends on the wind. And the other day we probably flew, I would say, about 25 kilometers as the crow flies. No, maybe, no, it couldn't have been that far, actually. It was probably closer to 10 kilometers as the crow flies. And there we have mum and baby wildebeest. Uh, I'm not sure how they've been, they've either been separated from the main herd, or, more likely, they're part of the very small group of sedentary ones that live in this area. Those ones are running at light speed. Tossing up the dust there. Frank, you say, is this the dry season? No, Frank, it isn't. This is the, we're coming to the end of what we call the long rains, and that is the, well, six weeks to three months of rains where the thunderstorms build just about every afternoon and dump on the area. I think the reason that it looks pretty dry is that up until, uh, well, probably about a month ago, it has been extremely dry in this area, and in fact in the whole of Kenya. 
and this is one of the most well-watered areas that there are at the moment, and it's why the wildebeest migration has arrived slightly earlier. Look at that wonderful shot of a balloon. That is what Senzo is experiencing right now on the same colourful sort of balloon. And you can see it rising there with the heat. I'm told reliably by our broadcast director that, uh, or technical director, that the, the gas being burned there is propane, which apparently is pretty good for balloons. Hello, Ali, you say? Yes, morning, morning, Izzy. Yeah, Susan, I agree with you. You say you can't wait to hear Senzel's reaction to his first balloon ride, nor can I. Lauren, another, you know, very good question, one that's asked a lot. You say, do the animals react to the hot air balloons? Yes, they do. If it gets close, if it goes straight over the top of them, you can see the hippo and the impala there are not reacting at all. But if it goes over the top of them, they do. They run. Um, they are afraid of it, uh, certainly when the gas is, is blowing. I don't worry about it too much because, you know, it's, it's such a, a fleeting fear that they feel because the balloon disappears so fast. So I don't think it's too much of a, an issue. Amy, you want to know what my favourite part of the Mara has been. Well, I say, Amy, that it's been my trip on the balloon. I've also done a trip on the balloon, and that's definitely been a real highlight for me. The Governor's Balloon Safari guys are enormously competent. They have a wonderful sort of way of expressing their joy around the Mara and all the animals. They've got some good guiding knowledge and... Well, this sort of experience, even if it isn't complete silence, just very, very special indeed. Those were some zebra there. And the term I've been using quite a lot of late is vanguard. They're the sort of vanguard of the migration. They come in first before the wildebeest. And I mean, very soon these planes are going to be filled with lines of traipsing wildebeest moving hither and yon as they enjoy the Mara Triangle, which is the area that we're flying over now. You can see the balloon's been flipped around again now. Um, just retain the picture. There we go. I think you'll find all those gaps in the vegetation could easily be um, could easily be termite activity or some other kind. Yeah, it probably is termite activity. Now that well, you're looking straight at me there, now that little knoll on the escarpment is where Angama Mara is, and that's where we're sitting right now. So I'm staring down over the valley from that area there. And this is a marsh, clearly. Now, the marsh areas are great if you're not driving a car. So they're perfect for balloon safaris. You can see not many roads there, but you can see a number of hippo paths. And I suspect the elephants like to make their way to and from over the marsh there. And you will also find, well, probably buffalo, uh, but not a huge number of things like the migrating wildebeest. There seem to be some Thompson's gazelles all the way down the bottom, but they're just just on the fringes of the marsh, some zebra, and that's very nice to see. Now you can see, of course, we're very high up now, and so the animals aren't reacting in the slightest. Rishi Junjunwala, you want to know why it's called the Triangle? Well, the Masai Mara, or the Mara, is split into two sections. The Mara Triangle, which is a sort of private conservancy, that's where we're in now, of roughly 500 square kilometres, or 50,000 hectares. And then off to the other side, 100,000 hectares or so, the other side of the river, is the Masai Mara National Park. And together they form the Mara, uh, of 150,000 uh, hectares, or 1,500 square kilometres or so, and the, it's split into a third by the river, and the river cuts it basically diagonally, forming the triangle of the Mara Triangle, so that's why it's called the Mara Triangle. Um, Velma, you say that the Vildes and Zebras always cross in the same place? No, uh, they don't. 
but there are traditional crossing points over which they cross all the time. So, for example, we've only seen them crossing at one crossing point so far, but they are predictable enough for us to know that we can put cameras, for example, at traditional crossing points and be fairly uh, sure that they will cross at some stage during the course of the year. Ali, you're wondering about leopards during the migration. Will we see them? Well, leopards do occur here in fairly large numbers, well, in fairly good, healthy populations, and it's mostly in these wooded areas. And because there are not a huge number of roads that go through these areas, we tend not to see as many leopards as we might say in a place like South Africa. But that's not to say they aren't here. They are absolutely here, and we do see them from time to time, and they are relaxed. And they tend to be very confiding with us. So, yes, we do see them. And then, Aqua, you wonder, oh, an appropriate question for you, Aqua. You say, how is the water fed into this marsh? Is it springs? There is a spring that feeds the main marsh, the, that gives the name to the marsh pride. Apparently, there is a spring there. But I think that is uh, flood water and, and springs. It's flood water and springs at the moment, of course. There isn't any flood water. But uh, largely, those marshes, of course, will hold water from flood water. But right now, yes, probably springs. You said, what has been my favourite sighting from the balloon so far? Well, almost certainly that black rhino we've just seen. That was really special. Now, it's my fervent wish one day to be able to head down on foot through those forests. I just think it would be the most spectacular wildlife experience to wander through those green forests. And they're so open underneath, you know. I just think it would be very special. So hopefully one day that privilege will be granted to me. Not many walking through there at the moment. Uh, Madhu, you want to know if we'll be off-roading in these wilderness areas with the trees. We, we can off-road, but not through the trees, no. Certainly not on this side of the river. Maybe on the other side of the river there's some areas where it might be possible. But largely, no, the off-roading takes place only in the clearings where they're very well drained. Noel, you're sharing memories of your 2014 trip to Governor's Camp and balloon safaris. Well, that's great stuff. I bet you will never forget them. Marcy O'Rourke, you said, do wildfires ever happen? It's a wonderful question, that, because it means a very common question. People are very worried about fires. Yes, from time to time. In fact, I could smell fire and see smoke yesterday. But at the moment, these grasslands are a bit wet to burn, so I don't think they're going to, they're going to burn now. Um, Rishi Junwala, Jun Junwala, you say can we walk on the f in the Mara now at the moment? Not yet, uh, but uh, one day hopefully that will be possible. Now we're going to see some hippo. I hope there's one in the lee of the stream. It's flowing quite strongly today. There was quite a lot of rain in the catchment area yesterday, or certainly uh, towards the catchment. And I think that that has certainly brought a little bit more water down. And you can see it's not exactly a sort of clear and raging torrent. It's a muddy river. It is perennial. Kat, you said the trees look like broccoli. Uh, well, yes, I suppose they do. I do think they taste like broccoli, though. Stephanie, you say, can you do a safari down the river? That would be fun, wouldn't it? Like you do it in, say, the Chobe River or the Savuti Channel. Uh, no. Uh, or the Zambezi, even. It's not really navigable, actually. It's uh, quite narrow. And that means that uh, you'll come across a pod of hippos, for example, and they'll have nowhere to go but through you, or you through them. And so it would be something of an extreme sport to do something like a canoe safari down the Mara River. I wouldn't suggest it. Uh, lots of the areas I, at the moment certainly wouldn't actually be deep enough for a canoe safari. And so, no, I don't think it's a great idea to do canoe or, or safaris down the river. And certainly with a number of hippos, it would make it very dangerous indeed. And Michael, 
you say that governors does offer walking safaris? Yes, I saw some people walking yesterday. We're just not set up for it at the moment, and hopefully we will be over the next, I don't know, few years or so, but we'll, we'll keep you posted on that. Laura, you want to know how many miles you're able to traverse when the balloon's over the Mara? I think, I think this trip will probably be between six and eight miles. Question visiting the Mara in the last week of August, concerned about scanty rains this season. Will it affect wildlife viewing? That's from Matrishva. Um, I think end of August will be a good time to be here. I don't think that the wildebeest will have left by then. I think they'll still be here. If the rains continue in this area, they'll absolutely still be up here. And Janine, you say the strongest river will make the migration crossings more dramatic. Well, absolutely they will. That's when the crossings become the most dangerous, I suppose, for the poor old wildebeesties. Now there's another balloon way below Sinzor, is now probably sitting about a thousand feet above the ground. That's about as high as they go. Lorraine, you say, have I had tea and scones in the balloon yet? No, unfortunately, nobody offered me any tea and scones the other day. Uh, they did offer us a champagne breakfast, but we had to leave before we could eat that. So, Ruth, you say, are you doing a champagne breakfast when you land? I'm unfortunately not actually in the balloon. Now, Senzo is in the balloon, and I hope that somebody hands him a glass of bubbly as soon as he lands, because that is a wonderful way, of course, to share this. Raren, you say, am I in the balloon or in the tent? Um, I am in the final control at the moment. There are the balloons, everybody, that we are looking at. And there's another one floating down below, about a thousand feet or so. Here, you say, what are scones? Well, they're sort of cakes, really. Um, <laughs> there you can see the river bending so beautifully down through this area. It is a lifeblood, and of course, a number of tributaries that feed it. So, Senzo, I think, will probably be fly. What they'll probably do is fly another. You can see that I think the wind's probably dropped quite a lot now. They seem to be flying a little bit more slowly than they were earlier. Isn't that cool? <laughs> That's very cool. And they'll probably just go over the next lip of the river because they're now in the Masai Mara proper. No, not proper. That's the wrong way of putting it. They're in the Masai Mara National Reserve. And across the river is where they're going to have to land. There we have got some hippos. Huge pot of hippos. Now you can see if you're in a canoe and you came round the corner and were faced with that raft of, well, terrifying hippopotamus flesh, you'd be in some difficulty. And hopefully we will see one or two. I would really like to see the front of the wildebeest herd. That would be great fun. Well, you're wondering why we don't broadcast from the vehicles that side of the river. We do. Scott and Brent have been across there regularly. Jamie's been across there. And Janine, you say you could watch this all day. I know, isn't it just wonderful? Especially as the light changes. It was so dark when we started this off, and now it's bright. And you can see the hundreds of different colours of green and yellow, and, of course, the grey snaking river, which is just so very special. Izzy, you're wondering if they, um, oh no, sorry, you weren't, you're making a comment saying they look like bouncy balloons. Yes, I don't think they'd feel very bouncy if you jumped on into one, but they might. And Madhu, you're saying, where are the herds? Well, the last time we saw the first big herd, or the first sort of uh, front runners of the herd, they were about, uh, ooh, say, 12 miles south of here. Uh, at another very steep crossing, uh, not much unlike the bank you're looking at now with all those hippos. And we watched, well, thousands of them crossing twice now we've done that. And interestingly, there were no crocodiles, no lions on either side. 
which was a bit strange. Scott, who watched the second crossing, was very perplexed by it. He thought it was very odd that he didn't see any lions there. There, the sun is now reflecting off the river. This is a very rare straight patch of river, actually. You can see how much greener it was. Now, we were asked a little bit earlier, I forget by whom, about whether or not this was an underground, an, a, a sea many millions of years ago. Um, I don't think that was the most influential thing about this. I think the most influential uh, sort of environmental uh, impact on this area has been volcanic activity. And there's been a huge amount of volcanic activity. We're in between the Western Rift Valley and the Great Rift Valley. And if you don't know what those are, those are two very important geographical features of, of Eastern Africa. And basically, the African continent is separating. And that's why we get so many great lakes along the Rift Valley and many valleys. And that tectonic upheaval has caused a huge number of volcanoes. And the volcanoes, in turn, have dumped a massive amount of ash on this area. And over the course of millions of years, uh, ash has created a, a situation where the soil is immensely fertile. And that's why these grasses or grasslands are able to uh, sustain such enormous numbers of animals. And there's still one or two semi-active volcanoes re relatively close by. There's a vulture, that's quite fun. It looks like a vulture. But we'll get to fly over the top of it now. More hippos in and out of the river. I'm hoping to see a crocodile as well. That would be quite fun. Oh, there it goes. That's a white-backed vulture. Uh, you can tell it's a white-backed vulture because it's got hey, everybody together. White back, yes, well done. There's some more hippopotami. And there you can see how the river is going to make hundreds of oxbow lakes during the course of the next, well, I don't know, 100,000 million years or so. I imagine it'll take another 100 years for it to break through that bank. Uh, look at the size of that raft of hippopotami. Thank you, all of you. I'm just seeing your comments now. As I asked about how you knew what vulture that was, well done. You all said it together, right back. Laurie and Raron. There's a hippopotamus still out for the night. He's having a good time. Still not back in the water, so he's obviously probably a young bull who's just been sort of celebrating while sailing away with his mates. Now, I'm not sure for how much longer we're going to continue this, but well, we'll keep it going for as long as we can. And you can see the open nature of the bush there. It really looks like fairly mature forest. And it is there, of course, that you will find a large number of the leopards. Aqua, uh, you're wondering if the Maasai manage any of the wildlife. Um, well, the whole area is owned by the Maasai. And so, yes, they do manage some of the area. Now, this is a private conservancy that we we're not flying over private yeah we are I think we've just crossed back into the triangle so we are watching an area that is managed as a private conservancy so it's run a little bit like a conservation business but um, the other side is run by is a national park and owned by the Maasai and leased from them but of course I mean when you say Maasai, you might as well be either referring to a tribesman, a local tribesman, cattle herder, you could be referring to a very senior government politician. So it's, you know, it's, it's difficult to, to answer that question. It's, it's not an, a sort of homogenous group of people in the same way that you wouldn't sort of refer to Americans, for example, as a homogenous group of people. Ooh, a little bit of of a, I don't know what happened there, but a picture breakup. 
Bill, you're wondering if we can expect the water level in the Mara River to increase uh, this migration season, or is this it? I don't know. I think, you know, this is my second time in Kenya. This looks like some gazelles running to the right there. I think you'll find that the river could easily pick up, and certainly we've had some big storms. But we're coming to the end of the long rains, and so I don't know how much more rain they're going to have in this area. Marcia, you say, do the Maasai live on the reserve? Uh, no, not in theory. There are some that herd their cattle onto the reserve from time to time. Um, Duma Filo, you say, Habari za asubuhi nanzuri Masai Mara. Thank you very much. You say, how is the morning, if I'm not mistaken? And it is good in the Masai Mara. Yes, there we go. You are lingo's <laughs> helping me. Thank you, Duma, for that. Very nice. I'm quite pleased with myself now. I feel greatly pleased that I understood that. Gemma, you say, what's the difference between a gazelle and an antelope? Uh, well, they're very closely related, but they just have a slightly different uh, physiology, slightly different morphology. I mean, further to that, it's a little difficult for me to tell you. Um, actually, I should probably do a little bit more research on that, but they're very closely related. Uh, Beck, you say we're being spoiled. I feel I'm being spoiled too. Rishi, you say Jumbo. Yes, hello. Um, and we're now looking at a wonderful herd of zebra. Now, you can see we've headed quite a long way south from where we've begun. And we're still moving at quite a speed. I don't know what speed we're moving at. So I'd say between uh, maybe six and eight miles we're going to travel in total. And we might be coming into land. This is a little nerve-wracking. Um, but it could be quite fun. <laughs> and those wildebeest, of course, are the front of the herd. There we go. So we probably won't land with you on account of the fact that it will be bumpy for Senzor. It's not about... We had a landing the other day which felt like it was a, a computer-operated... Airbus it was very, very smooth indeed, but if you're on camera, it will feel a little bit rough. Look at the wonderful colours there of the grasslands. And you can see how thick it is. And if you fly over many parts of Africa where it is semi-arid, which this is, and this is slightly above semi-arid, you'll find that there's an enormous amount of soil in between the grass tufts. Here, there's just grass wherever you look and rich, rich soil exposed only by the termites and perhaps the game paths. There's a dobi to the far right, which is now gone, and you can see our shadows floating quietly over the Maasai Mara. Very, very enjoyable stuff. Hoping to see one or two more animals there. We have some Thompson's gazelles running along. There are two species of gazelles that we get here. The other is the Grants, much larger than this, much rarer. I've only seen one Grants gazelle. There it is, trotting away, exploding in a hundred different directions. <laughs> seems to be a lot more animal or grazer activity as we head towards the south. And as these grasslands become denuded of nutrients, as they will do as the herds move through them, so the herds will move further towards the north. Rishi, are you saying what speed is the balloon moving at? I don't actually know. I think it's probably around about 10 miles an hour, maybe slightly less than that. Well, it looks yeah, I mean, I think you could probably almost run at the same speed that this thing's going. So, yeah, I'm going to say around 10 miles an hour. You can see some gazelles. You can see the animals have got no problem at all moving out of the way if they want to. So, yeah, I'd say about 10 miles an hour or so. And you say, do I have a fear of heights? I don't, and I'm, but uh, obviously sitting where I am now, um, it's not really a problem. I'm sitting on a sofa, which is only two feet off the ground. It certainly doesn't make me very nervous. Senzo, of course, has now been a thousand feet up, and I'm going to be fascinated to talk to him. 
I really think he's done a fantastic job today. He's kept that camera really nice and steady. Uh, he's never been in a balloon before, and so I think he's doing a fantastic job here. And so I'm, I hope that he is not afraid of heights, because that, of course, will have <laughs> immeasurably uh, well lessened his enjoyment of the experience. And Beck, you say you're really envious of Senzo right now. Yes, I think we all are. He's having a very special morning. I think the wind has changed slightly, you know. I think it is blowing slightly more from the west now, and he's blowing slightly towards the east. It's quite interesting. Now, if you're wondering how on earth he'll get picked up or how some anybody could pick up anybody in the balloon, they watch them. So there will be a breakfast set up coming. They'll predict. The pilots have got so good at predicting where the balloons are going that you find they can almost pinpoint from, say, I don't know, about half an hour out. They can pinpoint where they're going to land according to the wind. And it's really quite brilliant. And when we landed the other day, our car was parked exactly at the landing spot, which was just brilliant. So Senzo is going to be picked up. Uh, by, I think it's probably Jared and Yana, who are two members of our team, one of whom is fairly closely associated with Stefan Winterboer, who you will notice on safari fairly soon if you would like to go on safari from the Mara today. And if you are perhaps just watching the Governor's Balloon Camp thing, or Governor's Balloon Safari uh, Facebook page and wondering why it is or how it is that so many people are talking about safaris in the Mara and live safaris in the Mara. Well, we are called Safari Live and we have an arrangement and a relationship with Little Governors, with Governors Balloon Safaris and we'll be taking a live safari just after this and you can go to wildsafarilive.com if you want to watch that and you can see more of those topi that you're watching there but this time from the ground. Steph will be taking a drive then. Yeah, I think, Edward, you've nailed it there. You said this is magical. It is, isn't it? It's just absolutely astonishingly magical. And I'll tell you, I'm sitting in this final control area here. What is that? There's a hyena. That is fantastic. There it goes. Looks like a young youngster as well caught out. Should be back at the den site by now. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Had a good night out. Just like that hippo. But I will tell you, I'm sitting in the final control now and there are three people watching this feed and they're all kind of mesmerized by it. Aren't you, everybody? They're all waving at me now. They're not allowed to talk because they're here. Oh, you'd, you'd have to hear them. if we can't spot one or two more animals. There's something pale in the background that looks like a Thompson's gazelle, perhaps. It would be very nice to see a large herd of wildebeest, but I don't think they've got this far north just yet. Looks like some more topi there. My new favourite antelope. It is a grant. There's a grant gazelle, everybody. That's fantastic. That's very exciting. And I don't know if you can tell the difference in size between that and the uh, Thompson's gazelle we saw earlier, but much bigger. That's really nice to see. Now you can see there is a little bit of alarm there from the animals, but like I say, it is fleeting. The balloon will fly over the top of them and they will sort of be left to wonder what it is that's just happened. Unless you say you want to know which way we decide, how we decide which way to look, uh, it's impossible to decide because you're going to miss something as soon as you turn around. Uh, there's just something to see every single side. Now, how much do you think affected tourism? Mm. Sorry, I'm just quickly reading a few questions here or comments. If 
Senzo is able to hear me, he can actually probably just hear me through the microphone. We haven't got the full setup going today, but yes, he will be able to hear me during most of these um, sort of migrations. But there is a very, very slight delay between what I'm saying and uh, what you're seeing, which means that basically it translates to it's quite difficult for him to follow my voice because he's hearing me after the fact. And so basically I'm following him. Unlike on the vehicles where the cameraman, oh, there's more hyena activity there. That's exciting. And you can see these ancient pathways that they've cut through the grass. Isn't that nice? That's really great. These paths will eventually lead to their den, I imagine. So just from a technical point of view, it is quite interesting because on the vehicles, the cameramen follow the presenter's narrative, what the presenter's saying. There you can see a balloon way up high. That's so cool. But here, I follow the cameraman. I think that's our antenna, isn't it? That's fantastic. So that's how we're broadcasting to you, everybody. Just that, that, that little antenna on the side of the balloon is how we're getting a picture. Up, I showed you onto the Angama Mara uh, knoll, if you like, the part of the mountain where we're sitting. Uh, that's where it's going. And then it's going out to you all over the world. Brilliant stuff. Now, you can see these pathways. Robin, you are Raren, sorry, you are noticing these paths. Yeah, they're paths that go to and from somewhere. I noticed one yesterday, an extremely large one, that was obviously being used by animals to go and drink in a marshy, in that marshy area. I drove towards that marshy area yesterday, obviously being used to go to and from watered areas and grazing grounds. There's a vulture. Brentley o. Smith is online now. Welcome, awaken, awaken up, Brent. Brent says, would I like some coffee? No, thank you, Brent. Uh, I've already had some. There is a... Looks... Oh, goodness, what is that? It looked like it was a bird of prey, obviously. Uh, either a, a buzzard. It looked like a common buzzard to me with a very clear differentiation striping. That's very nice. Thank you very much, Brent, for your offer. Brent is another guide, by the way, for those of you who don't know. Not often that he would offer me coffee. I'm not sure that he'd actually deliver, um, but I won't test him if he really had coffee. Ooh, that was a little bit... <laughs> that sends all. He is now telling us that we're going to land, and so we're going to cut off our broadcast now. Thank you, everybody. That was just very special to have you along with the little, with the governor's balloon safaris, and we will see you later at some stage. Bye-bye.